Welcome students to another video in the Essential Cell Biology series. This is chapter 12, part A. This chapter deals with transport of material across cell membranes. Students should recall that different membranes from different organisms may perform differently and have different properties when it comes to transport. The chapter is divided into four parts. We'll be dealing with parts A and B in this video. The next video shall deal with parts C and D. Students are expected to comprehend some general principles by which chemistry can cross membranes. And number two, uh, concentrate on transporters and how they function. Data obtained with artificial membranes has added to our knowledge. When liposomes are constructed without any proteins embedded in their surface, uh, these experiments reveal the porous nature of the plasma membrane itself to only a select few types of molecules, as we'll see on the next slide. Natural membranes always contain proteins in addition to phospholipids, and these proteins empower that membrane to increase the transport of materials across the two sides. The textbook has quite nicely subdivided part A of the chapter into seven learning outcomes. The first four are listed on this slide and we'll be dealing with each one of these in sequence very shortly. And the remaining three learning outcomes are presented on the second slide here. The first take home message is that naked lipid bilayer membranes are not very permeable to many things, especially ions and uncharged polar molecules. The data from the liposome experiments further suggests that the rate at which molecules can pass through these artificial membranes, those without the proteins, has been recorded. It appears that small molecules, which are nonpolar, have basically an unhindered opportunity to pass across the membrane based on their diffusion gradients. However, small molecules which have a polar nature, such as water, ethanol, do not really pass through the membrane readily. They do have some potential to pass through the membrane if given an opportunity. The molecules which are really important to the cell, such as food molecules and waste molecules, they tend not to pass through the membrane at all, or if they do, they take a long time. And these molecules have to be somehow imported into the cell and exported, and we'll see how that happens in a subsequent slide. Now, the smaller this molecule is, you would expect it to pass through the membrane. However, if these molecules have a charge, a positive or negative charge, then that charge is almost exclusively going to prevent them from intermingling with the hydrophobic nature of the phospholipid tails and those molecules are 100% excluded from passing through. This in itself may appear to be a bad thing but in reality the presence of these ions can be made use of by biological systems for their benefit. As we see in this learning objective the ion concentrations both inside and outside the cell are very different. Their composition is kept different because of their inability to pass through the lipid bilayer. And that ability allows nature to build up a force, an electrical force or a concentration force along any membrane that is complete, such as a plasma membrane. Although all ions are important to nature, some are more important than others and have been used again and again to do something for cells. The most common ones and the most important are listed in this table. Sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, protons and chloride ions play significant roles as we'll see in this chapter and subsequent chapters in this course. One thing is very evident. Uh, the concentration of these ions may be higher on the outside than on the inside of the cell. So this column here, the second column, gives you the internal concentration in the cytosol. 
And the final column gives you the concentration in the external environment, the extracellular space. So for sodium, you can see that the sodium ion is much more concentrated outside the cell than it is inside. And this appears to be true for almost all cells. So it must be an ancient mechanism. The difference between the two concentrations is approximately 15 times greater outside than inside the cell. The other positive ion is potassium, it has the opposite orientation. So it's much higher inside the cell than it is outside, and that too about 15 times greater. Magnesium is like sodium, uh, high on the outside and low on the inside, as is calcium. And we'll talk about calcium in a few moments. The next ion is very important, and that's going to be the hydrogen ions. Uh, these are very important in dictating the pH of that environment, more so than anything else. And you can see here that the internal environment of most cells, mammalian cells in particular, is a pH of 7.2, while the pH outside the cell is 7.4. So that difference in pH should tell us immediately that the inside of the cell will have slightly more uh, protons than outside. And that's indicated by the concentration difference here. The inside being half that of the, sorry, the outside being half that of the inside. And then finally, we have the anion chloride, which is high on the outside and low on the inside. And that proportion is very similar to the sodium, because sodium chloride is a salt a common salt that we talk about when it comes to living things. So that makes sense, that sodium chloride is high on the outside of the cell compared to the inside. Now, do you need to remember these numbers? And the answer is, for a couple of these rows you do. So for sodium and potassium, and for chloride, and for hydrogen ions, it makes sense. Uh, for other ions like magnesium and calcium, uh, just need to remember that it's high on one side compared to the other. The differences in the concentration of these inorganic ions that we just spoke about on the previous slide across cell membranes creates a membrane potential. And the word potential means a difference, and this difference can be used to generate by force a membrane potential force. And that membrane potential force is equivalent to a battery. So if you think about a normal battery that you have in your house, uh, one side of the battery has an excess of negative charge, and the other side of a battery has an excess of positive charge for that same particular element or compound. We return to this concept again and again in this chapter, as we can make use of that in generating work for the cell. So let's tackle the next concept. We mentioned earlier in this slide that membranes themselves, the phospholipid bilayer, is unable to allow the passage of ions. So how do ions actually cross a membrane? And the answer is simple, that nature has devised proteins which allow molecules to pass across. These protein molecules fall into two classes. The first type are called transporters, and they would be akin to turnstiles in the membrane. And the second class are called ion channels, these will be akin to tubes that allow ions to pass through from one side of the membrane to the other. So it's the channels that we're interested in at this point. This slide is a depiction of the two classes of proteins allowing the passage of molecules across membranes. So transporters in this textbook are indicated as having a very sophisticated uh, structure that changes shape as the molecules are bound and released. The alternative are the ion channels. The ion channels are depicted as a gap between the interior of a protein through which certain ions can pass if they have the right physical and chemical properties. So ions, it should be remembered, can flow at tremendous speed. For instance, every second millions of ions of sodium can pass through from one side of a membrane to the other down their concentration gradients. Whereas transporters tend to move one molecule at a time, although at high speed, but not as fast as 
channels. The follow on learning objective number five says that solutes, these are substances dissolved in a solvent, they cross membranes by either passive transport or by active transport. Passive means without the use of energy. Active means the use of some form of energy. This slide allows us a comprehensive view of the different ways in which membranes can be transposed, summarizing what we've just learned above. So the first thing we learned was number one, this method is called simple diffusion, where the molecule simply passes through the membrane by there. The second example that we mentioned previously was ion channels. So these are called channel mediated uh, passages and the channel protein is responsible when it's open for allowing the transport of ions down their concentration gradients. It's important to realize that these proteins can be in an open configuration or a closed configuration. Therefore the cell has control over when and how much the channel is open. The next class are the transporter mediated proteins which allow molecules normally non-ions to pass through the membrane. And an example of this would be glucose or amino acids. And they do so by changing configuration. But once again, there's no use of energy in any of these three because molecules are moving down their concentration gradients. Should the concentration of the substance be higher on the inside, uh, this protein then would have a net movement of the molecule in the opposite direction. And then finally, we have the fourth class. These are proteins which pump or actively move material uphill against their concentration gradients. And that requires energy. So that is called active transport compared to passive transport. Students need to be very familiar with this slide. The next learning objective is where we start building up our knowledge, compounding our understanding. So here it says two elements combined together are important when it comes to examining what will happen around a membrane. And those two elements are the concentration gradient, the chemistry, and the membrane potential, the physics. Both of them combined will influence which way and by how much ions will move if they are permitted by the cell. Students further need to remember that for the vast majority of cells in nature, the overall charge on the outside of the cell is generally more positive than on the inside of the cell. So this is a relative value. So for a bacteria, the numbers may be one set, but it's still going to be positive on the outside overall. For a human kidney cell, the same thing, but the numbers may be completely different. So the outside is going to be positive relative to the inside. And in fact, all cells under normal resting conditions are negatively charged on the inside for various reasons. And this difference in distribution of charge, electrical charge, allows them to store a potential, a force that can then be utilized at subsequent times in the future. The reason that this figure has two panels, <coughs> panel A and panel B, has to do with how forces work, depending on which side of the membrane that particular ion is at a higher concentration. So in panel A, we can see that the positive ions are already high on the outside compared to the inside. So the blue represents the concentration gradient in terms of chemistry. So we have a lot more of these ions on the outside than we do on the inside of the cell. And as you know, positive charge is attracted to negative charge. So when the ion channel is open, the movement of these ions, <coughs> not only is it down their concentration gradient, but there's an extra force pulling these ions into the cell based on the physical force, the negative charge. So that's an important commodity. And sodium is under this influence inside the cell. So the two forces are additive in this case. So why do we have panel B? Well, panel B may be looking at potassium ions. And as you learned earlier, 
potassium ions are high on the inside of a cell compared to the outside. So when they open their ion channels, then the two forces are working against each other. As far as the chemistry is concerned, the potassium ions will want to go downhill along their gradient. That means they want to leave the cell. However, as you know, positive charge is not compatible with positive charge, just like two magnets with the same pole. With respect to the chemical gradient, potassium wants to leave the cell, but with respect to the physical gradient, potassium is hindered from leaving the cell. And at one point, the two forces will reach some kind of compromise, but they'll be working against each other. So the thickness of this arrow compared to the thickness of the arrow in panel A is thinner to indicate that the force, the overall force, is smaller. This is a concept that students must become familiar with very quickly in order to progress through the rest of this chapter. The last general commodity that we deal with in part A of this chapter is the seventh learning outcome, which says that water moves passively across cell membranes down its concentration gradient. And that process has a special name. So osmosis is a name reserved exclusively for the movement of water molecules across membranes. Every membrane allows water to pass through to a small degree. And this movement of water is from a concentration of high water molecules to a concentration of low water molecules. So water molecules obey the same rules that we discussed previously in this video. But sometimes the passage of water across a membrane has to be increased to a volume that's going to be needed by that particular cell. And to that end, nature has invented over evolutionary time special protein channels through which water can pass, and just water. And those channels have a special name, they're called aquaporins. And aquaporins are simply tubes that are suitable for the passage of water molecules. And again, water will pass one way or the other depending on its concentration. If it's high on the outside, then it will pass across to the inside, and conversely. So what you're seeing here are the aquaporins depicted as these green structures sitting in the phospholipid bilayer. As it says in the textbook, uh, these aquaporin proteins normally work as a tetramer in real life. So four of these channel proteins come together and they sit side by side under normal circumstances. If you take one of these aquaporins and study that in more detail, then you can prove that water is the only commodity that travels across these by doing studies such as this, where you're looking at the movement of molecules and you can see here, water molecules are passing through each one of those aquaporins. So these four represent the four particular aquaporin complex, the tetramer. The osmosis of water is one of the biggest challenges that cells face. As we know, cells can live in different environments. And over evolutionary time, cells have come up with different adaptations to cope with the water movement problem. So protozoans creatures that are normally single cell, like an amoeba, they have solved the problem by developing a vacuole inside the cell into which water is pumped on a regular basis. And when the vacuole gets full, the vacuole then fuses with the membrane of the cell and eliminates its contents. So every now and again, the vacuole will discharge its contents. And then another vacuole will form inside the cell which will then pick up more water. So that's the solution that they do in order to continue to live in a watery environment. Plant cells, on the other hand, don't have these vacuoles to the same effect. So their vacuoles do not fuse with their cell membranes. These vacuoles can store water, but they can also store other commodities such as carbohydrates or pigments. So how do plant cells survive in a very watery environment where water wants to enter their cells on a regular basis. Well, they do so by surrounding their cells with a thick layer called a cell wall. Uh, this is a layer of proteins and sugars, which is very stiff 
And as the cell absorbs water, then the cell wall forces back, fights back, and prevents the cell from expanding beyond the dimensions of the cell wall. So this is a very elegant way to prevent, prevent further water from entering the cell. How about the opposite? When the conditions outside the cell have less water than inside the cell? Well, in that case, water will leave the cell to the environment. And in those circumstances, the cells will wilt. Your cells, animal cells in particular, have a large internal cytoskeleton, which helps them maintain some type of osmotic regulation. So we don't do it this way, nor do we do it this way. Uh, there's a third mechanism called the cytoskeleton. The second part of this chapter, part B, focuses on these protein transporters and their functions. As this slide and the next one reveal, there are eight learning objectives for this part of the chapter. And we'll go through each one of them individually. So let's start with the first learning objective, that passive transporters move a solute along its concentration gradient and electrical gradient. The two are known as the electrochemical gradient for that particular solute. Now it's very important for you to keep in mind that every substance has an electrochemical gradient, but some material has no electrical charge, is electrically neutral. So in that case, this particular component is zero. So the only thing that matters is the chemical gradient. And that's true for uncharged molecules that then only have to listen to the concentration gradient. But other substances, like these protons, they do have a charge as well as a concentration, and they have to be then governed by the electrochemical force. This figure further indicates that different membranes have different capabilities, depending on which protein transporters are embedded in their membranes. So there's no rule that says the same transporter must be present in every location within a cell. So as we can see here, this is a typical eukaryotic cell. Uh, there's a mitochondrion, and the mitochondrion, as we know, has two membranes, the inner membrane and the outer membrane. And the two membranes normally have distinctive profiles when it comes to these transporters. The lysosome has a membrane, and that membrane will have its own complement of transporters, in this case, uh, proton transporters. So the concentration of ions, hydrogen ions, inside the lysosome is much higher than in the cytosol of a typical cell, and that makes the pH of a lysosome very low. The same thing happens when it comes to the passage of food molecules in and out of the cell. The cell membrane, the plasma membrane, has its own complement of transporters. So different membranes in different positions can have different complements of these structures. This figure concentrates on one of those transporters. So this is the glucose transporter, called the GLUT transporter. The glucose transporter only has the capacity to move glucose down its concentration gradient. And it does so without utilizing any energy. The energy comes from the environment. So as a glucose molecule impacts a open transporter, it will bind from the outside. The transporter will change shape and it can go in either direction at this point. It could go back to the original shape where the glucose will be eliminated and there will be no movement of glucose. But there's also a possibility that it will go the other way and release the glucose to the inside of the cytosol. Once the glucose is released, then the empty transporter will transition back towards this state and pick up another glucose molecule. Now, what students must remember is that another glucose molecule could bind to the open configuration while it's facing the cytosol. But because the glucose concentration is low, generally, on the inside of a cell, this event is very rare, less rare than this event. So the overall effect is that glucose molecules are moved inwards, even though the transporter may be bouncing around in all different directions. Please grasp that concept 
is the similar to the concept that we discussed about open doors and closed doors. That when the door is closed, it's mostly closed. When the door is open, it's mostly open. Just to make sure that you understood this, if the glucose concentration happened to be reversed, as in liver cells, you could have a large excess of glucose on the inside and less on the outside. In that case, the net movement of glucose will be out of the cell. Let's turn our focus to those transporters that require energy in order to function. And in that case, the effect is to move the solute against its concentration gradient. That is uphill from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Why would a cell want to do this? Well, maybe it wants to concentrate something internally that it needs and it's not available at a high concentration outside. So under normal circumstances with passive transport, that material will pass out of the cell and that would kill the cell. So in this case, uh, active transport is used to concentrate that substance on the inside. So once again, the way that these proteins work is not always the same. They fall into three general classes when we study enough cells at once. So the first one is called a coupled transporter. And what it does, it uses a gradient that exists already in the cell to assist in the moving of a second commodity at the same time. So in this example, if the red squares represent sodium, and we said that sodium is high on the outside of the cell in most circumstances, then the sodium will want, will want to get into the cell. And as it travels into the cell, it will cause a change in this transporter. And that, as, this, as this transporter changes shape, it then has the ability, before it recoils back to the other side, to pick up this orange molecule. And the concentration of the orange molecule is low on the inside of the cell and high on the outside. So under normal circumstances, the orange molecule would want to move into the cell. But if it's coupled, if it's tied to the movement of the sodium, then the orange molecule will be picked up and transported out. And we'll see how that works in a bit more detail on the next slide. Uh, the second class, as shown here in the middle, uh, it moves one molecule alone. So it doesn't rely on sodium to power its turn style property. In this case, the energy comes from ATP directly. And the ATP energy causes a conformational change in the shape of this protein. And it allows this orange molecule to be pumped out of the cell. And then finally, in bacteria and other protists, uh, they have adapted a protein to use light energy and a vitamin-based chromophore to capture and convert that energy into a form that changes the shape of this protein, causing it to pump the orange substance out from the lumen of the cell into the exterior space. So these are three known mechanisms by which proteins can pump material from one side to another. So the best known and studied example is the sodium potassium pump of animal cells. It uses energy in the form of ATP directly to pump sodium and potassium at the same time, but in opposite directions, as we'll see on the next slide. In this textbook, they just call it the sodium pump. In many other textbooks, it'll be called the sodium potassium pump or the sodium potassium ATP pump. So please be aware of that nomenclature. This cartoon shows us how the sodium pump works. This is a compound molecule which moves two substances at the same time. So what it's doing, it's moving three sodiums out of the cell, out of the cell, for every two potassiums that enter the cell. And it does this in a very cyclic fashion. Now, because the sodium is being moved up its gradient, it requires energy. And because the potassium is being moved up its gradient, that requires energy. In fact, both the movement of both ions requires energy. And this protein is so clever that in a single cycle, it can do all of that. But it requires energy, lots of energy. 
So for each cycle, it uses one molecule of ATP. And the ATP disintegrates on the surface of this protein, at least behind its high energy phosphate group, which powers the whole process. The ADP, the exhausted battery, then can be recharged somewhere else in the cell and uh, it can replenish this process. Remember, there's millions and millions of molecules of ATP inside the cytosol of a cell. So this process is called a pump because it moves things against their gradients. Well, the question then becomes, why is the cell doing this? Why do animal cells waste energy performing this maneuver? And the answer is, they pump sodium outside the cell to maintain a high concentration there so that later on, at some other time, they can use that energy distribution to do some immediate work for the benefit of the cell. It's just like you buying batteries just in case you need them later on. Many authors relate this distribution of sodium and potassium as a analogy to a reservoir. Why do we store water in a reservoir? Because when it's needed for producing electricity, it's available. So this analogy works. The sodium pump stores energy for a later time period. And that energy can be used to do some type of work for the benefit of the cell. Let's look at a second most important use of a pump in animal cells. So that entails the calcium pumps. So the calcium pumps are constantly running and their job is to maintain a very low concentration of calcium in the cytosol of the cells. Why? That will become obvious in another chapter. But for now, let's look at the dynamics of a calcium pump. Calcium pumps are able to use one molecule of ATP to pump two molecules of calcium. And that's done by the protein initially binding two calciums, just by random probability. And the ATP comes along next in the cycle, and it delivers its phosphate group to this particular amino acid on the nucleotide binding domain of the protein. And we're familiar with domains from a previous course. So this domain of the protein is like a trigger that interacts with ATP. Now the energy left behind by the phosphate on the aspartic acid is then used to power the configuration change in the shape of the binding pocket. And that change in configuration expels the calcium to the lumen side or the exterior surface of a cell. We mentioned earlier that coupling pumps means that one molecule can move down its concentration gradient and at the same time some of that energy can be used to power the movement of the second, second substance up its concentration gradient. And those pumps come in different flavors too and that's depicted on this slide. And we give them different names so the students need to remember each one of these three names and what they entail. Let's look at the simple one here. So a uniport means a single transporter. Uni means one. So just one substance is moved by the transporter. In this case, it could be glucose. So glucose is moved alone. It doesn't need to be coupled to something else. But in other evolutionary advanced proteins, the transporter can move two substances. Sometimes the two substances are moved in the same direction, and that's called a symport. Sim means same. But in other cases, the two substances are moved in opposite directions, and that's called an antiport. So if this was sodium and this was potassium, that would be the sodium-potassium pump. So the sodium-potassium pump is an antiport transporter. So please be familiar with these labels and when they should be used. Sometimes it's necessary to move glucose against its concentration gradient. And as you can imagine, that would require energy. So moving glucose downhill is, doesn't require energy, but moving glucose uphill does. So if you need to move glucose uphill, what you could do is couple that to a concentration gradient of sodium, for instance. And that's exactly what cells have done. 
So this protein here is a coupled protein. It moves sodium and it moves glucose in various directions. Now, in this particular case, glucose is moving against its concentration gradient, whereas sodium is moving down its concentration gradient. So the force that we had stored in building up a concentration of sodium high on the outside is now being tapped into to move glucose for the needs of the cell. So let's see how that process works. Well, the transporter itself, the pump, goes through a number of configuration changes in a very sequential order so that things can be moved. And we have different labels that you need to remember because they could be used in various exams and tests. So this means occluded empty. And that means the cavity is empty. Whereas occluded occupied means that the cavity is occupied. Now the cavity will never be occupied just by glucose alone because it has to transition through this phase here. So let's have a look at what's going on. So the transporter here is closed on both sides and there's nothing in its cavity. By chance, it will open at the top to the exterior surface of the cell. And the first thing it does, it picks up a sodium ion. And the presence of that sodium ion then changes the configuration within the cavity such that it waits until it picks up glucose. And if it does pick up glucose, then it changes configuration to form this occluded, occupied configuration. And that change in shape is then transmitted through to the other side in the inward open configuration. And both the sodium and the glucose are eliminated. The protein then reverts back to the occluded, empty configuration, which is the same as here. And these arrows tell you that it can go in either direction. So sometimes, some of these proteins, what they do is they go to the outward open configuration and then go back to the occluded empty and they expel the sodium. But overall, the process is going to turn the glucose into the cell, building it up high on the inside. This is beautifully demonstrated by the lining of your digestive system, where the cells that line your digestive system are facing the lumen of the gut where the food passes through, and on the other side where the blood vessels are, uh, that's where the food has to be then transported. So in this case, you can see glucose concentration is normally low between meals inside your gut compared to the glucose concentration within the cytosol of those lining epithelial cells. And then glucose concentration is relatively low on the other side in the extracellular fluid on the way to the blood vessels. So you can see what's going on here, right? The passage of glucose from within the cytosol to the blood vessel doesn't require energy. So the glucose can use a passive mechanism. And that's where your passive glucose uh, uniport transporter comes in. We learned about them some time back. So here no energy is needed because glucose is passing down its concentration gradient. But hang on a second, there's some other molecules here, protein transporters, that need to pick up glucose from your gut. And as we mentioned, glucose is low in the gut. So these have to work as a pump. So these are pumps and these are passive. So the dark greens are passive, the light green here is a pump. What powers this pump? Well, the, it doesn't get powered directly by ATP because there's no ATP being utilized. So what drives this pump? It needs energy. Well, the concentration gradient of sodium is what drives the pump. So sodium is high in the gut and it's very low inside the cytosol of a cell. So as that sodium rushes in, it powers the uphill uptake of glucose into the cell. So this side of the membrane has these light green symport transporters. And this part of the membrane here has the dark green. And the diffusion of this protein is prevented from transversing to this side by these tight junctions here. 
So these are staples in the membranes of cells that form a belt around the entire cell to stop proteins from drifting to the wrong side. And you can imagine what could happen if this protein accidentally was making its way here, or this protein made its way there. So you should think about that answer. So what we just discussed with the uh, sodium pump and the sodium coupling is very common in animal cells. But not all cells follow the same paradigm. The cells of plants, fungi and bacteria, they use a slightly different system. They don't use sodium to power their pumps, they use protons. So here's an animal cell and we just discussed this so I won't go into that in any more detail. But on this side we have a plant cell and the plant cell has the same needs as an animal cell. The only difference between A and B is that instead of using sodium we're using protons. So protons are at a high concentration on the outside and as the protons rush in they can also drive the passage of material against its concentration gradient. So please study these two figures. They are very important for assessment purposes. Finally, this table here, taken from the textbook, gives you a commodity to study. So please be familiar with all these different types of pumps available to natural systems. Uh, the list is not hard to understand because it has some very logical linear threads running through the entire thing. So if you take your time and look at the transporter, you should be able to predict what the function is. The only thing that you may need to remember is what's the source of energy, right? So in this case, uh, these for, for these uh, five, it's ATP directly. So they are called primary ATP pumps because they use ATP directly. Whereas these two, they use the effects of ATP from an earlier pump, the sodium pump. So these are called secondary transporters. Um, we'll talk about those in class.